Let's see if you can pick up on this right away. Look at this stuff. Isn't it neat? Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? Okay, we're going to have fun. <laughs> Welcome to Book Me Podcast, sponsored by Nimbus Publishing. I'm Lindsay Glode Rainingbird. Join me as we journey through contemporary Canadian literature, reading as much as we can and chatting with authors, illustrators, and other bookish folk. Celebrating our dynamic, diverse, and vibrant national literary scene as we go. So grab a snack, get cozy, break that binding, dog ear those pages, let's dig into it. Today we're talking to Nancy Regan, maritime mega celebrity, journalist, podcaster, former host of Live at Five, and my personal life coach. Of course, I'm only joking, but that's what it feels like after reading From Showing Off to Showing Up, a vulnerable part memoir, part guide to pushing through perfectionism, fear, and imposter syndrome to live the authentic life you deserve. I feel changed in the process of reading this book and already have a host of friends I plan to pass it along to. Welcome, Nancy. Well, now you're going to have me start the podcast in a puddle of tears. Uh, that's really, that really touches my heart, honestly. I, I really appreciate that. You know, that's what the book is for. And that's why I was uncharacteristically willing, or if not willing, able to put this really vulnerable personal book out into the world, because it just felt like, in, in a way, it felt like I had no choice. The book wrote me instead of me writing the book. Let's talk about the title then. You tell me, from showing off to showing up, what's the difference there? I like the fact that it might make people go, oh, what's that about? And the subtitle actually does the same thing because the subtitle is uh, an imposter's journey from perfect to present. For me, showing off is living your life according to other people's expectations, looking for praise, approval. And showing up is really, here I am, take me or leave me. It's not about, you know, your judgment and acceptance of me. And it's not about me performing my life in a way that will make other people happy. It's, this is, this is the real deal. And it's the most liberating thing when you really do show up. When I coach people in public speaking, it's a perfect way for me to say, are you being performative or are you being contributive? Are you focusing on what you're giving or contributing? And for me, showing up is really being here with you and really just listening to you and giving you my heartfelt answers and not worrying ahead of time about, am I going to be enough? Is, am, you know, will I be able to give her the answers she wants? Will I make mistakes? I know now, and that's where the perfect to present in the subtitle comes from, I know I'm not perfect, and I'm never going to be perfect, and I'm so much more comfortable in my imperfection than I ever was. So now, for me, it's about being present, and the quality of my presence with you is a gift, as yours is to me. If you're focusing on your performance when you're out on stage, you're going to be nervous because that's a focus on how other people are judging you. If you're looking at what you're giving the audience, if that's where your real focus is, you're going to be in the zone. And I think that that's something that you just have to accept is that you're going to make mistakes. No matter how you show up, there's always going to be imperfections. And it's about just accepting that and then moving on. That's right. And and also accepting it and learning from those mistakes. There's a beautiful book by a woman named Carol Dweck. I think it's beautiful. It's called Mindset. And it separates people between two mindsets, growth mindset and fixed mindset. And people who have a fixed mindset think they have a certain amount of intelligence. They were born with it and that's what they've got. And they're very risk averse because if they fail, it means they're a failure. And I naturally fit in that category. And a lot of people, even the people who know me well, resist that. They say, what? You know, how could you be on TV? Because I was on TV in fear a lot of the time and always worrying about making mistakes. I have a husband, for instance, who is an entrepreneur who is very growth mindset. You make a mistake, you see that as an opportunity to learn, and it's a much more liberating way to live. 
Fortunately, Carol Dweck points out in her book that you can. We all know about brain plasticity and you can change. So, you know, I used to be very fixed mindset when I was on television for 15 years uh, on live TV and then continued to do some TV after that. But I was always so afraid to make a mistake because I thought that would make me a failure. And the truth was, I was always afraid I wasn't good enough. It was a very interesting way to live life in the spotlight, showing people how confident I was all the time while not really feeling my own light and feeling inadequate. And the weird thing about that, Lindsay, is that the more people make a big deal about you, when you feel that sense of being an imposter or imposter syndrome, it doesn't make you feel better. It actually makes you feel like more of an imposter. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. So it's like you go I the opposite you. way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I've got them so fooled. Yeah. So for people who aren't as intimate with imposter syndrome as you and I, <laughs> you you want to explain a little bit of what that is. This is the anecdotal way for me to explain it. I had my vice principal come to me in high school and say, I want you to run for the student council president. And a lot of my friends were like, yeah, yeah, that's great. There was no way I was going to do that because I had this idea that I had everybody fooled, as I say. I, I made them believe somehow that I was more capable, smarter, more everything than I really was, whereas my own inner critic was always nattering away, telling me how not enough I was. And that continued through the years. Because for me, my biggest secret for years, including when I was projecting this air of confidence on TV, my, my inner child's greatest secret was that I was a total dork and I had to keep the world from knowing that. When really... People embrace dorks. We love dorks. Love dorks. I love my dorky self now, but I also love, love, love how many people have reached out to me to say they relate to that so much. That idea of the world seeing them in such a different way and them really feeling this deep sense of inadequacy that they're, you know, very reluctant to reveal to the world. I have felt like this my whole life. And I, I thought I was the only one. And it's like, Absolutely. no, we're all a bunch of dorks together. And that's it. You know, we are. We're all in this together. We all are are riddled with insecurity. And, and, and yet we're also brave. And we can be generous and greedy. And it's that paradox of being human that I think unlocks so much freedom in terms of acceptance of yourself, but also acceptance of others. You know, when we stop, again, judging each other and saying, you're this, as humans, we want to pe put people in boxes. You're this, you're this. No, you know what? We're all so much. And we need to accept our so muchness. There's a new term for you. <laughs> Lindsay, Accept your so muchness. I'm trying every day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's it. And that's where the presence come in, comes in. Yeah. Because it's a practice. And if I sound like I'm preaching that I've got it all figured out now, I make it very clear in the book. I hope yes, you'll you agree yeah. that I am in the struggle. And, and I mean the juicy, fabulous struggle that I'm grateful for. But it's just, you know, always bringing myself back to the present moment because most of my life I lived in the past and the present, uh, worrying or ruminating and being fearful. And neither of those states can exist when I'm really locked into the present moment. That's one thing that I related to incredibly was how you felt about like self-love and giving yourself a break and that sort of thing. It's like you can look at your friends or your family and you can see them for everything they are and appreciate it and love it. But you can't give that same grace to yourself. And that was something that I was just like, damn, Nancy, <laughs> get me good with this stuff. Yeah. Someone asked me the other day, what was your greatest challenge writing the book? And I said, oh, that's so easy. It's like it was 
getting out of my own way, having to get out of my own way over and over and over so that I could be in that accepting or open state where I could accept the invitation from creativity and inspiration and just let it flow. When I was in my own way, I was worrying. I was thinking, oh, there's a huge mountain. I'm never going to be able to climb it. I was thinking, you know, I'm not a writer. Who's going to believe that I'm a writer? I'm a TV. People know me for communication, not for writing. Anyway, so if you're out there and you're writing, I'm listening, talking to anyone out there right now who wants to write a book and has been standing in your own way, just gently with compassion, pick yourself up and put yourself on the side and then just calm down and accept. And for me, the presence practice is really what enabled this book. It enables my life to be more relaxing, more joyful, more fun. So explain to us then, what do you do to be in the present? What's the presence practice that you just talked about? Well, my relationship with presence, I would say, started with Eckhart Tolle and Oprah, you know, got to give her cred. She started talking about soulful things on television long before it was cool or really acceptable. She pushed the limits with the network for sure. She talked to Gary Zukoff who wrote Seed of the Soul. And that was in the 80s. And that that's a big deal. Um, it got a lot of people thinking, especially a lot of women going, oh, there's more to life, you know, and I want to understand myself more and so on. So then she did the series with Eckhart Tolle on um, A New Earth. And it was a it was a big series of interviews that she did. And it was sort of you know, like a book club. And so I was listening to his book and also kind of taking part in that, not, not, uh, overtly, but listening to each of their segments. And my boys were young at the time and I was listening in the car and they'd be there sometimes. And my youngest son would often jokingly talk like Eckhart Tolle, who has a very slow cadence and so on. And Matt would say, Oh, well, you just need to enter (laughs) into the moment. And I would laugh because he was making fun of it. But it also showed he was actually absorbing it. Yeah, through osmosis. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so I, you know, what I have learned about being present is that there is this moment right now when you and I are sitting here. I, if I'm focused on what I was worried about driving here or a concern that I have about how something's going to go later on today, then I am not giving you that quality of my presence for this conversation. But I'm also a victim of my mind. So I have a very busy mind. And when I worry about things, allowing that swirl of worries is like pouring fuel onto a burning fire. Whereas if I can quiet my mind and just be in my breath and just think about exactly what I'm doing, if it's driving, maybe it's walking through the woods and just seeing what's in front of me, noticing, watching, feeling, feeling my own breath, that is not only incredibly relaxing in the moment, but it's also like in some ways, going to the gym and working out your muscles, because the more you practice that kind of presence, the more you can go to it whenever you need it, including when life is swirling around you and you feel completely overwhelmed. I like to think of it as the difference from being on the turbulent water on the top of the ocean or going to that place of stillness that's way below. Same ocean, but it's always there and available to us. But we have to get out of our mind and just into our body and into our breath. So you can do that by meditation, which is something you practice? I do, but I'm not a good meditator. I felt much better knowing that after I heard Pema Chodron, who is a Buddhist nun, who I really recommend. If you're interested in presence at all, just go to YouTube or, or get one of her books or listen to one of her books. Um, and her, her first name is P-E-M-A, and it's Chodron. 
And she is, she was married, I think she was married twice before she ever became interested in Buddhism. And she's got such clarity in her voice. And she will say, she's been meditating for 25 years probably. And she says, I still have never managed to quiet my mind. <laughs> so you know, when you hear someone like that, it really gives you permission to say, oh, okay, I'm not so bad. Because the funny thing, Lindsay, is that even meditation, so many people fall into the same trap that I did. You start to meditate, but you come to it with a perfectionism. Yes, I was just going to say right. that. Yeah, It makes you feel like I'm failing. I'm failing. I'm not good at this. And that's exactly the opposite. It's not, oh, there you go again. It's like you treat yourself as if you were a small child with compassion and gentleness. And you go, oh, there you are again. There you go. <laughs> now just let that go. It's OK. And one of the other parts of your book that was really speaking to me was when you were talking about emotion and how to kind of relearn to express and understand your own emotions and the ways that when you're raising kids or you were raised that people steamrolled your emotions and that sort of thing. So it, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit about how to, for mothers like myself who are now just teaching their kids how to deal with their big feelings, some advice you might have or... Yeah, I love that question. I'm very careful in the book to say that there is no parent bashing going on, it it was really the way parenting was done then. Yeah. You know, the way most of us were raised, even, even um, crying, you know, being upset, you can have a little cry, but then you stop that right now. You put that away. And that's what we do to ourselves as we get older. So you watch other people, you watch yourself, you might start to cry, but there's a real clench and you want to shut it down. My uh, really good friend, Anne Berube, who has a new book called The Burnout Antidote, she said to me, when was the last time you cried until you were done? Yeah. And I was like, that hit me like on a cellular level. I was like, you, you can do that? <laughs> and that's what I believe now. So coming from a childhood where, you know, we weren't really allowed to express anger. I didn't allow anger in myself for a long time. But what happens when you contain emotions is that they are there. They are, you know, they are going to affect how you are in the world. It was only when I encountered the concept of embodied emotion, which is through Dr. Anne Berube, that I realized that, okay, emotions are meant to move through us. Allow those feelings, giving yourself permission to have those feelings, then it leads to a much healthier uh, way of being in the world. Embodied anger is anger that we allow out in a way that's safe for other people and it's good for us. Disembodied anger, we see a lot of examples of that in the world. It's like a machine gun. You know, it takes down a lot of people around us and it doesn't do any good. Now, as a parent, holy cow, is that ever a challenge? A lot of people I know, our conditioning comes from the modeling that we had as kids. I have a a teenage daughter right now. And, you know, when she feels big feelings, if they're uncomfortable for me, my automatic reaction is to try to shut them down. And then my that's my lower self, right? <laughs> my higher self, which is more aware of who I am and who I want to be and really present, says, no, she needs to feel those feelings. I believe that the best thing we can do as parents is have our own practice of presence to help us separate from that lower self or that ego and be able to really help our children learn to navigate their emotions because that's probably the best, most powerful gift we can give them. Model that that way of dealing with emotions in a healthy way and... Um hopefully then they can do that. But also from your book, it's never too late to learn to deal with your own emotions in a better, more healthy way. If you're the frustrated person who lashes out, like I am sometimes. Me too. It's like you can make it a practice to be 
better than that. You can choose to be better than that by working hard. Yeah, I think life is a journey. And I think you you might not feel like you've stepped onto a path. You haven't had time. You've been too busy or whatever. But no matter how busy you are, this will make your life better. The more you come to understand who you are and and who you were before the world told you who and how to be. Yeah. That's my journey is to get back to that six-year-old self. This is not written from the perspective of someone who has it all figured out. I am not a teacher in this book. I like to say I'm a seeker. Like, And people have said, oh, you use a lot of quotes from other teachers. And I'm like, yeah, because for me, this book is about saying to you, come on along on this cool path that I'm on. And, and oh, listen to this. And what do you think of this? And it's, it's like um, a woman who reached out to me who read the book. I think she's from Quebec or Ontario. She wrote this review. She reached out to me first, but then she wrote the review on Amazon that said the same thing, that reading my book was like walking arm in arm through a garden with me, <laughs> having this really great conversation. And I was like, wow, that's, yeah, that's what I want it to be. Aren't books the best? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Nimbus Publishing. You know, they took a flyer on me because this is my first book, and I think probably any author or most authors would feel this way. Uh, to have someone say, yeah, we believe you can do this, that's a huge push in the right direction. And uh, I'm so appreciative for their support. And also my editor, Whitney, Whitney Moran. Uh, she's so nice. Oh, she's so awesome. <laughs> also, and also, you know, she's been, she was a partner in this. In the same way when I was an actor doing a professional show at Neptune Theater in Halifax and learning, it's so interesting to see how a, an actor's performance is such a collaborative thing between the actor and the director. I feel like that with this book, between the writer and the editor. The collaboration is just so important to where the book ends up. So I, I've said to her in the past, I said, I don't know why your name's not on the front of the book with mine. Do you want to tell me what you're reading currently or plan to read next? What's exciting to you coming up? There have to be two categories because I do audible books and I do hard copy books, and ne'er the twain shall meet. So right now I'm listening to Justin Baldoni's Man Enough. Right. And I really am enjoying it. And in terms of what's on my nightstand, there is always a pile, and it's kind of ridiculous. I've had people say about my book, oh, I'm so sorry, I haven't read it yet. And I say, no, you know what? I believe we read books when we're meant to. And I've had books in a pile that, you know, might not have, they might have sat there for two years and not been read yet. But um, the books on my bedside table right now are Nosy Parker. Oh, good. By Leslie Crew, who is a Nimbus author. And I met her through promoting my own book. And do you know that her character, her main character in that book is Audrey Parker? And that is the name, totally by coincidence, if you believe in coincidence. It's the name of my very close friend who I talk about in the book who died three years ago. Right. And spooky. when... Spooky, that's isn't spooky. Isn't that great? It was like, we were meant to be friends. And I have a couple of books that are almost always there like um, The Impersonal Life by Joseph Benner, which is a book that I just pick up to bring myself back to my higher self, to you know, take me out of my ego, to bring me into my sense of being connected to something bigger than myself, but also feeling my own divinity and that light within. Uh, and a beautiful book by Eckhart Tolle, Stillness Speaks, because I need those reminders. Again, that's like I'm sure some people, uh, many people in the world use a Bible in that way. They have it tucked away in the drawer. You think of it in the drawer of a hotel where they just open it and it centers them. And and these books um, tend to do that for me. I've really enjoyed in the past couple months a book by a fellow who's become a friend now, James Mullinger, Brit Happens. He's a comedian. And he and my friend Ron James 
both have written books. Ron wrote a book called All Over the Map, and they are books by comedians that are humorous, but they're also so full of heart. And the one more book that's still on my bedside that I can't let go of is Pluck by Donna Morrissey. So now I have another pile beside my bed. (laughs) I could go on, but I won't. Thank you so much. And you have an excerpt that you'd like to read from your book. Give them a taste. Yeah. I, I thought I should maybe just do a poem because I've talked so much already. But this is a little section that includes a poem. And it's important to say that one of the most vulnerable acts in this book is me including my own poetry. Because you may find that it could have been written by my eight-year-old self. Uh, but it's really powerful to me. And I I believe, and this has been proven to be true by feedback I've gotten, when you create something from a true heart and soul level, that's the level at which it lands in people who are open to it. And so that I'm really pleased and proud to say that's what's happened. So this is an interesting little passage where it's both prose and poetry. Walking along the beach today, I had a profound experience of these practices enmeshed. Now, you're going to have to read the book if you want to know what those practices are. As often happens when I'm in nature, poems arrived. Like childbirth, I am not in control of the timing. This time, it was a couple of lines I'd written the year before. They dropped into my head and then suddenly demanded to be expanded upon, like a sibling who arrives and completes the family. Prompted by a close friend's story of a troubling relationship from her teenage years, these words had emerged. I'm not too much. I'm too much for you. Today, as I walked by the ocean, they surfaced in my mind like a drowning person breaking through the surface of the water. Then the next two lines, gasping for air. I'm so much, more than you can handle. I felt the impact at a soul level. I kept repeating it so as not to forget. I wanted to be able to write it down once I returned to the cottage, but slowly I realized that every time I said the first line... I felt a small swell of emotion. So I started saying that line alone, over and over. I'm not too much. I'm not too much. I'm not too much. And I started to cry. Dig, Nancy. Keep digging. Don't run away from this. I'm not too much. Pay dirt. And here's the payoff. By the time I had reached the end of the sand, my recitation of the line had changed dramatically. I was no longer the wounded child I had been just a few minutes before. I was a woman, owning the words, walking with a spring in my step, and light in my eyes. That's my definition of transformation. I'm not too much. I'm too much for you. I'm so much more than you can handle. Yes. Snaps. Snaps. <laughs> <laughs> that was so good. That that part in particular really hit me. I remember I have tears in my eyes right now. Yeah. It was a ma- the malson. It was amazing. Thank oh, you. I like that. That's a new word. It's a malson. It's a malson. Thank you. know, you. I used to do that a lot on TV where I'd mispronounce a word, but then my mind would be like, you made another mistake. Mm -hmm. And if you are focusing on your mistakes, you're going to make more and more. So I just want to embrace that emulsion. I'm going to use that in conversation today. Okay. (laughs) I'm going to say to somebody, that is emulsion. And and they'll probably end up feeling less than because they'll think, oh gosh, I don't know that word. What is that a reference to? A TV show? A book? (laughs) She's so well read. What is she talking about? No, I will quickly tell them that's a made up (laughs) word. By my new friend, Lindsay. So there you go. (laughs) Thank you so much for joining me today. I had a wonderful time talking to you. So fun. Nancy Regan from Showing Off to Showing Up is in bookstores everywhere. Available now. Please read it. It will change your life. And thank you for listening and hanging out with us. Join me next time on this book lover's journey as we try to read more, read Canadian, read local. You know, all the good things.